Hello, I'm Emily Rhodes. Today in this month's webcast, we're going to be talking about Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. Um, it's such a powerful and really vitally important book. When we talked about it on Hampstead Heath um, with other members of Emily's Walking Book Club and also over Zoom, we all agreed how important it was, how we wanted everyone to read this book. And we felt really happy that it's on the curriculum to be learnt at, at school. Um, I really feel no one's reading education is complete without having read this. It, it feels so essential. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this book and hopefully convince you to read it too. If you have read it, if you have thoughts you'd like to share on it, please let me know in the comments below. So... I think maybe I'll begin by reading a bit out to you. I'm going to read from the beginning of the book. So I feel this really exemplifies what is so special about this book, how clever Achebe is in his writing. So, chapter one. Okonkwo was well known throughout the nine villages and even beyond. His fame rested on solid personal achievements. As a young man of 18, he had brought honour to his village by throwing Amalinza the cat. Amalinza was the great wrestler who for seven years was unbeaten from Umuofia to Mabino. He was called the cat because his back would never touch the earth. It was this man that Okonkwo threw in a fight which the old men agreed was one of the fiercest since the founder of their town engaged a spirit of the wild for seven days and seven nights. The drums beat and the flute sang, and the spectators held their breath. Amalinza was a wily craftsman, but Okonkwo was as slippery as a fish in water. Every nerve and every muscle stood out on their arms, on their backs and their thighs, and one almost heard them stretching to breaking point. In the end, Okonkwo threw the cat. That was many years ago, 20 years or more, and during this time, Okonkwo's fame had grown like a bushfire in the Hamatan. He was tall and huge, and his bushy eyebrows and wide nose gave him a very severe look. He breathed heavily, and it was said that when he slept, his wives and children in their outhouses could hear him breathe. When he walked, his heels hardly touched the ground, and he seemed to walk on springs, as if he was going to pounce on somebody and he did pounce on people quite often. He had a slight stammer, and whenever he was angry and could not get his words out quickly enough, he would use his fists. He had no patience with unsuccessful men. He had no patience with his father. So, I think in this book, and you can see it here, instantly the reader, well, me in any case, feels quite lost you know it begins this Okonkwo was well known throughout the nine villages and even beyond okay who is this Okonkwo who's well known and if he's well known why haven't I heard of him and which nine villages and beyond where are we who is this person instantly the readers kind of put out of the frame of reference and I think this feeling of being quite lost continues you know when we go on to learn about Amalinza the cat and um, the engaging a spirit of the wild for seven days and seven nights. It feels like very, I suppose, exotic and other. And, you know, as a reader, you feel, uh, well, you feel a bit, a bit sort of uneasy, you know, maybe interested and fascinated in this other world, but certainly not at home there. Um, and I think this continues with, you know, the drums beating, the flutes, um, the description of the fight. Um, and even in the um, similes that are used, you know, like a bushfire in the Hamatan, um, slippery as a fish in water. You know, it, it's all, it's, it's a very different place from a, a London living room. Um, but then... Okay, so so this this sort of amazing description continues for a lot of the book, and 
so yeah, my first point is the setting is really vividly conveyed. You know, there's a lot about the food, um, the customs, um, it's richly detailed and you can picture it very vividly. And in part, this is, of course, a response to Conrad's Heart of Darkness, you know, where the, for those of you who aren't familiar with the book, it's a kind of European viewpoint of Africa, um, where the people who live there are seen as savages and, and it's this darkness and you know, Kurtz's famous dying words are, you know, the horror, the horror is kind of unspeakable, unseeable. I think Achebe is saying here, this is what it looks like, you know, <laughs> this is heart of darkness, this is the light, this is heart of light. <laughs> here, here are the villages, here is what happens in them, this is what life is like. And I think he, there's a moment a little later in the book where he goes, um, it, he shows he shows that there's, there's a scene where you're walking through the darkness. It gets very dark and it feels quite frightening. Um, and then the light kind of, it begins to get light and, and we see where we are and in the end, it's all okay. So I think it's very much a response to Heart of Darkness. It's, it's really vividly conjuring this setting, which feels very foreign and other and, and different to me, a white reader in London. Um, but then he does this brilliant thing. He describes a conquo. And so, okay, for a start, we see that he snores, <laughs> you know, instantly we're familiar with that. Um, you know, he breathes heavily and you can hear him breathe in his sleep. Um, and then he has a stammer and that when he's angry, he uses his fists. Um, and then the sort of key moment here is when he says he had no, he had had no patience with his father. And this is developed again along, so uh, there's this sort of amazing setting that's conjured and that kind of goes on and on and on. Um, but alongside that, there's this description of a conquo as a human, as someone who we know. Some, you know, we all know people who have had no patience with their father. We all know people who despise something in their parents and spend their life trying to go against. It's so familiar in this world that is so unfamiliar and where we're, we're kind of searching around for something to cling on to. We find a conquer and we see him as one of us, as a human. It's completely different to Conrad's depiction of these kind of subhuman savages you know he is so shown as being so human and I think that humanity is made all the more so for being in such an other setting and really throughout the book this um kind of contrast between the familiar humanity that we share with the Conquo and the unfamiliar setting which feels so different um kind of tussles and and plays and I think for many members of the book club this kind of dichotomy was what made the book such so engaging and so powerful and so fascinating um so yeah into this so the setting is very vivid but it's certainly not shown to be some kind of paradise or idyll it's it's harsh it's um it doesn't feel, well, it's hard because, you you know, you don't want to judge, but I think Achebe shows us things that it is hard not to, not to judge, um, particularly the custom among the people there of if they have twins, if they have baby twins, they are thrown out in the jungle in earthenware pots and left to die. Um, it feels so harsh that, and it is hard to read that without questioning um, whether or not that is right. Um, and in fact, there is a character in the book, a Conquo's eldest son, who, um, who feels really uncomfortable with that, who, who kind of can't bear it. 
um, I don't want to give too many spoilers away here, but there are, there's another moment of similar brutality that feels kind of wrong. Um, and I think it makes, it certainly made me feel uncomfortable because of course you don't want to judge and you don't want to feel yourself judging, but it is also hard not to in those extreme instances. And I think many of us readers felt that kind of discomfort. Um, however, so into this system come the white missionaries and um, they set up a church and they um, have a kind of different order, um, a different code of morality. And of course we see the, the characters who, you know, were, were not that comfortable with the previous system who were perhaps slightly ill-treated by it are the first to, to convert. Um, but the missionaries, of course, are just the beginning and they've paved the way for the whole kind of colonialist setup. Um, and before you know it, it's, it's, it kind of crosses a line and is um, catastrophic. And this is particularly felt by a conquo. Um, and we, you know, we wonder how he will, how he will cope, how he will respond. Um, we noticed that the missionaries, especially the first missionary in the book, um, actually seemed quite, quite kind, quite well-meaning, not, not as, you know, we, I, I compared it to a, the velvet glove that cloaks the iron fist, you know, the, these awful atrocities are coming. But at the beginning, it's the kind of soft touch, um, you know, they sort of sidle their way in. And actually, we reflected on a discussion how that is still the case with a lot of things. You know, if you think of the big corporations and things and how often the, the customer facing front is so kind of engaging and kind and nice, but but that masks a, a really sinister, um, harsh sort of force behind it. Um, so that felt very kind of prescient in a way. Um, one reader who came on our Zoom pointed out this really brilliant quote from Desmond Tutu, which felt absolutely apt. I'll, I'll just read it out here. He said, um, when the missionaries came to Africa, they had the Bible and we had the land. They said, let us pray. We closed our eyes. When we opened them, we had the Bible and they had the land. And that is shown kind of literally happening in this book. Um, it's really fascinating and, and kind of grim. There's a lot to say about this book, of course. Um, I think the last point I want to touch on is the language in which it's written. Um, it's written in English, but um, not the kind of English that I'm saying now. It feels like a very unique English. It, the, it's laden with um, kind of metaphors and similes and descriptions. It's very beautiful, unusual prose, um, which we felt made the book feel almost like a fable, slightly kind of timeless. Um, I think the decision to write in English rather than in Igbo or, you know, another African language is quite a political one and it's one which Achebe felt the need to defend and he wrote a great essay defending his use of English. And I will just read a tiny bit out from it here. He said that he felt, um, he, he chose English because it was a worldwide language and he said it had to be a new English still in full communion with its ancestral home, but altered to suit its new African surroundings. And I love the way that the English language is so adaptable, is always growing. So yeah, a fantastic book, um, really, really essential reading, and I urge you to read it and let me know what you think. Thank you.